Well, for our guest here this morning, uh, we've been in uh, a four-part series about what transformation is. And I actually showed you guys a video in the beginning of this whole series of a Marnock butterfly from a caterpillar to that beautiful butterfly that we see a lot of times here in Michigan during the spring or early summer. And we've seen that thing go through this stage of metamorphosis. And again, it, it changed. You could not deny it. It went from this green, ugly worm to this beautiful butterfly. And see, that's the idea of transformation. Transformation. And last week we were looking at, and we're going to finish up, how does this transformation take place? And we looked at surrender. And we see the Apostle Paul here. It says this in Romans 12 too, Do not copy the behavior or customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And the thing is, is this. It says this. Don't copy those behaviors and customs. And so many of us, we are pulled to the behavior and the customs of this world. I would be a liar to stand here today and tell you that there is no pull on us to be like the world. But again, I think about what God's Word says. We're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that show forth the praises of God. It doesn't mean weird. It means that we're different. And that difference should be broadcasted to where people ask questions. People should say, Clarence, what's so different about you? You don't react like most people would react in certain situations. And again, that is a great time for us to lift up the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ and say, listen, it's only Jesus Christ. It's only the Holy Spirit in me that I can go through these situations and say it is well. Listen, church, take every opportunity you can get to proclaim the name of Jesus. It says as we lift Jesus higher, that, that again, it'll be a banner that draws men to Him. How are they to know if we don't speak of Him? Again, many of you that know me, I try to introduce God into almost every conversation I have with people, believers or unbelievers. And some of you say, oh, Pastor Dave, that's your job. And I say this, it's your job too. You're not going to get away with that with me today. Because God's will is for you to lift up the name of Jesus also. But we see this, we're transformed by surrender. And we see the Apostle Paul, he gives us guidelines all through this chapter. And we've seen that, the idea of that in Romans 12, verse 1. And then we see, again, we have to seek a renewed mind. And we're actually going to look at that a little bit more today. What is it to have a renewed mind? And we see that in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And then we've seen last week that it's serving the mission of God's kingdom. And I said this, You've got to understand that God's kingdom is much broader than just the four walls of this sanctuary. God's kingdom is vast. It's huge. It's big. And again, so how are you serving the mission of God's kingdom? And we've seen that in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. So what is that? What is that mission? And how are you serving in the kingdom of God? This is not some ploy. I do not have a list back there on the table saying you have to serve. Put your name down under something. No, I realize this and you've been hearing me say this. Be careful judging people inside the church as far as what they're doing. I have people all the time that want to come and complain to me. say, Pastor, I don't think so-and-so ever does anything at the church. And I'll say to them, be careful. Because it doesn't. What are they doing for the kingdom? Are you seeing what they're doing in their neighborhood? How they're serving the co-worker at work? Do you see what they're doing for the kingdom? Listen, we have to become kingdom-minded. You realize we're just part of the body of Christ, right? And I said before, I don't know what we are. We could be an eyelash. We could be a little pinky toenail. All in this vast body of Christ. So again, we need to think more kingdom-minded. 
What am I to do in the kingdom of God? What does God have for me in His kingdom? And listen, part of that is going to be in the local church. I'm so grateful for our volunteers here, for everybody that serves here. We have a church that serves, that understands that that, that is part of what God has for them. But again, I always say this, let God speak to you. I think Jim Johnson actually said this last week, or maybe it was in mine in his talks together. He actually said this, listen, be in a body of believers that it's okay to try something and fail. How many realize here, we, we have a body like that. You guys show a lot of grace at times. And you know what? We might have folks that try something you know, we went through a, a Wednesday night series where we're having men teach here. We've had guys from the body here teach up here on Sunday morning. You know what? It, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And so again, think kingdom-minded. Being kingdom-minded. We've seen the next thing that Paul showed us was in Romans 12, 9-10. It was how to learn properly to love one another. It said this, don't just pretend to love others. And I said to you guys, don't you hate a fake? I do. I gave you the, the example of my Rolex watch instead of a Rolex. And the first good praise service where we were clapping, the face popped off. I don't like fakes and neither does God. God, he, he really has a problem with people that are fake. So it says, don't pretend to love one another. Listen, God wants us to love one another with a true love. And sometimes that true love tells, sometimes it's not fun. Listen, there's many times I have to talk to people and I usually start the conversation like this. I love you. My heart is for you. And I mean that. But sometimes I have to say some difficult things. That's love. I mean, if anybody, if you had a friend who you knew, and, and this friend was a worldly friend, and they were intoxicated, and they were your friend or your acquaintance, how many would let, you, let, let them get in a car and drive drunk? I would hope nobody here would. I hope none of you would say, hey, yeah, here, go ahead. I think the speed limit's 80 instead of 50. Go have a good time. Here's some dark sunglasses too. It's night out, but we don't want you to get caught, so just Go. Would that be a good friend? Absolutely not. So again, we've seen that we must learn to love properly and again, and not a pretend love. And then we've seen too, it takes determination. We have to be determined because again, we have free will. We make choices. And in Romans 12, verse 11, it says this. It says, to be determined, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord. Listen, how many of you know that sometimes this Christian walk, it's work. How many of you know that sometimes you have to wake up and look at the, the, the armor of God and say, am I putting it on today because I'm going into a world that is hostile, not only against me, but about, against Jesus who I serve? We've seen this, that we have to have the proper perspective. What's your outlook? It says this in Romans 12.12, 12, Rejoice in the confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. Keep on praying. Who is your hope? What? Jesus. Jesus is our hope. What are you putting your hope in? Is it the new car? Is it the new house? Is it the new job? What is your hope in? What is your hope in? And in that hope, are you being patient in trouble? We talked about that. We prayed up here because again, we have to have that perspective and understanding that God's a good Father. Over the 30-some years I've served Him, I know this, that God is faithful. I know that my timing is not His timing. I know that I want things now, but usually God has a work that He wants to do in me. That Dave has some character flaws. And through that waiting process, God's going to work on some of those things. It's called sanctification. We're all on it. You can't avoid it unless you just sit down and say, I'm done. And you know what? God loves you so much that He's not going to let you stay there. 
We need that proper perspective. And it says, keep on praying. Keep on praying. Don't stop praying. Listen, I think so many times, and again, we did a series here in Nehemiah where I actually called a prayer a shotgun prayer. The idea, boom. Those quick prayers. I remember once going over a hillside in the wintertime and all I seen was trees and I did a shotgun prayer really quick. Jesus, save me! And I'm here today. He heard it. He heard my shotgun prayers. But again, listen, I don't want to overlook the idea of a prayer closet. How many of us actually take time to pray? And it was Pastor Dick that spurred me on about five years ago said, listen, during your prayer time, don't only just speak words, but listen. Take time every day and just say, God, speak to me. God, you speak. So listen, it's the idea of, again, having that proper perspective. And then we left off last week with the idea of, of it's also community. How we're transformed. What does the Bible say about iron? Iron sharpens iron. Woo, sparks fly. How many of you have ever worked on a grinder or a hand grinder? You get those, you're grinding on that metal and you're forming that metal. You're getting exactly the way you want. All of a sudden, a spark goes down your shirt. Whew, it hurts. You get sparks in your glove. Or I remember welding too. And again, that was adding metal to metal. It was forming metal. And the thing is, is this. Sometimes it hurts. But how many realize it's a good thing? It's a good thing. And the thing is, is this, Paul actually gives us some verses here about community. It says this, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Do you see what he says? He says, eager to practice hospitality. It says, bless those who persecute you because he's talking about community. We have a community here at Momentum Christian Church, but we also have other sister churches that we have community with. And listen, any Christian you walk into, you should be able to have community with. You have something in common. You have the same Father. You have Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And we've heard testimonies about that, just how amazing that is, to where you can go across the country, run into somebody that knows Christ, and right away there's a sense of community. Oh, you're His too. And the thing is, is this, God is talking, He's placed us here as a church to be a body, a community together. And like Jim said last week, I'm so excited about this Thanksgiving dinner because I truly believe that's going to be real church. See, we, like Jim has said, we've a lot of times distorted church, and many of you know, we've made changes over here over the years to, to try to get away from that a little bit. Again, trying to get back to what Scripture is saying, what church should really be. That's why we have to be a body believer that truly loves one another. That are truly laying down our lives for one another. Preferring one another, it says in Scripture. And that means simply to lift somebody above you. And how many of you know in this world, <laughs> it's not the world we live in. We live in a world that wants to put you down, wants to put you down and under. You work in a workforce that, listen, people are trying to better themselves so they can get your job. Things out there are hostile. But that's not what God's called us to be. He says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. How many have ever done that? Mm, when that person cursed you and persecuted you. How many is this? God, Bless them. Yeah. No, usually it's this. God bless them. And the thing is, is this. This is why we need to be transformed. I'm hoping this is coming home to some of us here. It says, be happy with those who are happy. Well, we get, that's, that's pretty good. But sometimes that's even a problem. Somebody comes in and says, oh, God bless me with a new car. And you're like, oh, that's so nice. God, why wasn't I blessed with a new car? God, why aren't I getting what they're getting? Why? And we start complaining. 
He's saying here, be happy, truly happy for those that are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. I like how the, the NLT here says ordinary people. And don't think that you know it all. How many have ever been around those people? They know it all. Can't get a word in edgewise. It's hard to love those people, isn't it? But ask yourself this. Are you one of those people? Do you know it all? I'm learning more and more that I know less and less. That I know less and less. Boy, I used to be a preacher. You guys wouldn't have liked me much in my early 20s. <laughs> there was no grace. There was no grace. And the thing is, is this though, through the God's transformation, He's changed me. He's made me realize that I don't know everything. Last week when Jim did communion, I had an idea of that in my head, but I learned some things. They were good things. And the thing is this, we need to continue. Again, we get into this process of stinking thinking and we need, again, a renewed mind. We need to be transformed, continue on that journey of transformation. We see in Romans 12, 21, it says, Paul says this, to be able to see this idea of transformation take place and then stay on the path of it, we need to live righteously. Ooh, that's a tough one today, huh? Because a lot of times what people say is living righteously or living a holy life, this is what I'm told a lot of times, that's legalism. Listen, I'm going to tell you guys something. I came out of a church that was so legalistic. I know and I hate legalism. But there is something about living a righteous life for God. There is something about living a life of holiness. Jesus said this, Be thou holy, for I am holy. He said that about God the Father. Be thou holy, for I am holy. And it says this in Romans 12, 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Listen, I'm going to tell you, if you don't put on the armor of God every day, evil will conquer you. You will lose the battle, you'll get wounded, and you'll live a defeated lifestyle. You put on the armor of God. You have a weapon right here that strikes blows, but also protects you from blows. Are you using it? Are you using it? Listen, I am more scared than ever. I was talking to somebody on the phone last night telling me that Paul's writings aren't even legit. I, 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 this is what I said to him. Good luck facing your battle this week. Listen, the whole Word of God the whole Word of God, it has everything for us to get through this life, 2 Timothy 3.16 says. Are you using it? Are you hiding this Word? We were talking about this in men's group recently, how important it is to hide the Word of God in your heart. Are you hiding the Word of God in your heart? Listen, again, I will say this again, and I'm assured of it, and I know many men before me have said it, but there's going to be a day in a lot of our lives that this is going to be illegal to own. You're going to have to hide this. If you can't see where our country, our nation is going, and this is why I pray for revival. This is why I pray for an awakening in the church. Statistics tell me, and listen, don't take, I'm beating up the sheep this morning. I love you guys. I, I, I'm a fellow runner just like you. But statistics show me in the church as a whole that 80% of Christians plus don't read this. It's the most owned book, but the least read in the United States. And I say, no wonder you're going through life defeated. No wonder you're going through life beat up because for one thing, you don't have the sword of the Spirit. You're not using it. You're trying to fight a sword fight with a, with a stick, with a twig. And it doesn't work. You're going to be defeated every time. It says this, though. 
live that righteous life. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with doing good. Are you letting evil conquer you? That's a question you've got to ask yourself this morning. Are you allowing evil to kick your butt on a daily basis? And you know what? It says this, but conquer evil by doing good. Last night, the same person said to me, kept on saying, you're a good man. And I'd say, no, no, wait. No, there's nothing good in me but Jesus. He'd say, come on, you're good. And I was like, listen, Jesus even said that there's none good but the Father. So, so on His authority, I'm telling you, I'm not good. In fact, I've said this before, you wouldn't like me if I didn't have Jesus in me. I'd be nasty. But the thing is, is this, but conquer evil by doing good. Doing good, what's good? Again, I go back all the way back to Cain and Abel, what God said to Cain. Do what is good and acceptable in my sight. That's all God's ever asked any of us. And listen, Jesus' teachings throughout His teachings, Paul's teaching throughout. Again, good works won't get you to heaven, right? Faith produces what? Works, right? So again, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if He's your hope, you will be about doing good works. And again, be careful to judge because it can happen on the side of the road stopping for somebody. It can be all over the place doing good. But again, I'm going to say this. The important part of this is this. is hearing the Holy Spirit speak to you. It might be that you're in a restaurant right after the service and the Holy Spirit speaks. Pray for that waitress. We heard a testimony about this church that collected up bunch of money and called this pizza delivery person in it and blessed them and it was God's perfect timing. Again, this weekend, as I went by Port Huron, here was a guy out there saying to the sign, we'll work for food. I was going to deer hunting camp, so I had a bag of groceries. I always have to go shopping twice. I'm just going to start shopping, buy everything double. When I, when I go this next week, I'm buying everything double just so I can just not have to stop at the store. Thank goodness for the little grocery store there in Sanilac. And it's a little more expensive though. But, but I don't have to think about that. It says in the Bible to feed the poor. There's certain things that are in Scripture. And listen, again, we have to get past the idea. Now, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you not to, you need to listen. But again, that's a sermon i got to preach how do we hear the Holy Spirit? If I were to ask all you, because I'd say this morning, how many of you have a hard time hearing the Holy Spirit? A lot of you would raise your hands. If I were to ask you, how many of you have, have a hard time hearing Satan? <laughs> all of you would say, no way, I hear him all the time. How does he speak to you? Through your thoughts? The Bible says the Holy Spirit's a familiar voice. <laughs> how do you think God speaks to you? Through your thoughts, through His Word. God always confirms. He'll make things known. God is never going to leave you in a state of confusion. Satan's the author of confusion. I will say it again, church. If you're in a confused spot, where you, I'm so confused. Listen, you need to proclaim the name of Jesus. Cause Satan to flee. Because it's Satan that's confusing you. Listen, God, again, the walk of faith, walking with Him, there's things that we won't know, but there's a peace. An understanding that my Father has nothing but good for me. You're a good, good Father. That's who you are. We sang it this morning. Okay, this idea of renewed mind. i got five minutes, so we're just going to continue this sermon series sometime. But I can promise you it's going to be something that's going to change your mind. I'm gonna, I want to open up with uh, 2 Corinthians 4.16. And I'm actually going to read this out of Eugene Peterson's commentary this morning, just because it just, and it's a commentary, it's not a, a Bible translation, but I'm going to read it out of here. And if you want to follow along in your Bible, you can. It says this, if you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry the precious message around in an unadorned clay pot of an ordinary life. 
That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. (laughs) Amen. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles and we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they'll do to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder is what Jesus did, or what they did to Jesus among them. He does this in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. us. While we're going through the worst, you're getting in on the best. We're not keeping this quiet, not on your life. Just like the psalmist wrote, I believe it, so I said it. We say what we believe, And what we believe is that the one who raised up the Master Jesus will just as certainly raise us up alive. Every detail works out to your advantage and to God's glory. More and more grace, more and more people, more and more praise. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, but in the inside where God is making new life, Not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. And again, in in your script, in your in your Bible, there it probably says this. It says that we are, even though our outside bodies are falling apart, we're being what renewed. And Jim brought up this scripture last week, and was like, "That's the top of my notes." Even though your outside bodies are falling apart, the inside. Man, the inside of you is being renewed daily. It's being renewed. And I don't know about you, I'm grateful for that. How many realize that your bodies, they wear, they wear out? I mean, I, I have worn my hair right off the top of my head. Bump of my head. I, I have, listen, I have aches and pains every morning that I didn't have 10 years ago. I get out of bed and I put the armor of God on, and then I have to do my stretches and bends just so I can walk around at times. But the thing is, is this, or the renewing process should be going on throughout our life. Throughout our life. I want to, I want to read a Scripture because we're going to go back to this portion of Scripture many times because I believe that it talks about renewing and how we get renewed and how we get this renewed mindset. But in John Chapter 15, 5 through 8, and this is a portion of scripture that is very familiar, and I'm going to be reading out the ESV this morning. It says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Man, that is a huge few words right there. But there's a key, and we're going to talk about that. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. I'm often asked this question, can a person be saved and not be a disciple? Ooh. You're all waiting for an answer, aren't you? (laughs) Some of you are going to get angry at me. I don't believe you can be. I don't believe that you can be. Again, I'm going to say this. I'm a guy that believes that there's a lot of false conversion in the church. I see it every day. People that don't even have an idea what truly happened at the little prayer of salvation that they either raised their hands while everybody bowed their heads. That is, listen, 
I, I will go to the T's on that. That, that is so unbiblical. <laughs> it says that we're supposed to confess Christ among men. And this is how we lead people. Bow your heads. Everybody close your eyes. Not an eye looking. Now, if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, and we're not even going to explain what that means, slip your hand up real quick. I see a brother, I, a sister, I see that hand, I see that. And you know what? Statistics show me that 80% of those folks don't even get baptized. They have no idea what they did. But, again, that's why your Jimmy Kimmels can go around or Anybody can go around and say, hey, are you a Christian? Yep, sure am. What did Jesus Christ do? We recently, we, we did some job interviews here. And one of the questions we asked him was, what does it mean to be saved? Pretty important, right? Because again, we understand that to, for one thing, minister and be in a position like that, you, you better understand what that means. Better understand what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. You better understand what God's intent and Jesus Christ's intent is for you. The Bible even says this. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, listen, consider the cost. There's a cost to follow me. Listen, I'll say this. Salvation is a free gift. But to be a disciple is going to be, it's going to cost you everything. It could cost you everything. There's brothers and sisters around the world. I heard the statistic. Every five minutes, a Christian is dying for their faith right now around the world. Listen, they understand the cost. The cost of Christians that were beheaded, as they were being beheaded, they were saying that Jesus is great. He is my Lord. They're screaming this out as they're going down line, chopping off their heads. They've considered the cost. And the thing is, is this, I'm hoping by this series about the idea of renewing your mind, that listen, there might be some of you here today that you might be sitting here, and and again, you can argue with me, we can truly believe that everybody in this sanctuary here uh, is saved and we're all going to heaven. But then I read the book of Jude, which is a time to come. And the book of Jude tells me that in the end days, it's actually going to be people in my congregation that turns me over to authorities. Wow. So again, as we're going through this idea of what it means to have a renewed mind, you need to ask yourself some questions. As we look, because again, this idea of renewed mind, it says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. God is saying this, I'm the vine. And you're the branches. How many of you ever, uh, recently I pruned some trees in my yard, but how many of you ever worked with grapes and grape vines? Chris knows this, that many times, especially in the spring, you get a lot of different shoots, right? And somebody that's a vine dresser, because my dad used to be, and he used to have beautiful grapes, he would know early spring what he had to clip and what he didn't. And determining what he clipped in the spring determined the growth of the fruit. And my dad was this guy that prided himself on how big of grapes he had. Anything he grew, it was the biggest apples. It was, always, it was always the best. Because he had learned, he had educated himself in those things. And God is saying this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me, I am in him. Or I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. Now you need to ask yourself this question, church. Are you abiding in God? And I'm going to start when I, when I preach again. Next week I'm going to be gone. I'm taking some vacation time. Pastor Dick's going to be teaching next Sunday. But I'll be back and then we have Thanksgiving. But after that, uh, we're going to get back on the subject of renewed mind. But the thing is, is this. I want you to leave today. Are you abiding in Him? In fact, there's some homework for you. Go home and truly see what the Bible says it is to abide in Him. But it says this, He that abides in Him will bear much fruit, but apart from Me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in Me, he's thrown away like a branch that withers. How many of you know that there's a big difference between a branch that's on a tree and a branch that has been cut and left on the ground? 
Big difference. The one on the tree is strong. The one on the tree is green. The branch that's cut a lot of times and is on the ground for a day or so, it's brittle. It gets brittle. All the life has sucked out of it. Anything that is life in it is gone out of it. It loses its leaves. It no longer can grow fruit. It says this in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Did you hear that? It says this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. My words abide in you. It says this, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Now listen, this is not headed to be a name it and claim it message. But there's a key there about prayer. And I'm going to, next time we teach on this, I'm going to draw you a diagram that's going to make it very clear. Because again, when our minds are renewed, we don't see things the way that we used to, right? I've known people, honestly, that before they knew Jesus Christ, believed in abortion. They believed in abortion. And God renewed their minds. And now they see it for what it is. How many of you, have, after you come to Christ, your mind has been renewed? And again, that idea of being renewed is being new daily. Being made new daily. It's a process that takes place. And like I said, I believe what I'm going to be able to show you is this is going to set some of you free to be able to start to bear much fruit, Scripture says. And again, the reason why it says here, then this is not a name it and claim it type of message, but it says this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. You get it? My word abides in you. If you know what the Word of God says, you know how to pray, right? Right? If you know what the Word of God says, it transforms your mind. If you believe and read the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit lead you, there's a transformation that's going to take place, a renewal of your mind that's going to make you think differently, like love your enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you, bless those that curse you. There's a big mindset that takes place. So listen, stand this morning. We're going to close and we're going to continue down the road. I don't want to jam this into you and and you're not able to... You you all look very very smart, but I know this, that um, if we try to jam too much in, you won't get it. But listen, ask yourself these questions. First off is this. Are you taking those steps to seeing that transformation in your life that metamorphosis that's what that word means in the greek metamorphosis are you loving god are you allowing yourself and your will to be given up to be obedient to him and are you allowing the holy spirit to lead you and guide you and speak into your life and then i want you to ask yourself this Am I bearing much fruit for God? Am I bearing much fruit for God? And then you need to say to yourself, I know that is God's will for me because we just read it. And you have to take a brave step here and say, God, prune me. Remove anything from me that's hindering me from bearing a lot of fruit. I planted four new fruit trees in our yard this last year. You know what? A couple of them had flowers, but none of them bared fruit. This spring, I'll be pruning some trees. I'll be cutting off some what they call suckers that grow off the bottom of the trunk. I'll make sure that those are all cut off so no important nutrients is going to something that's not going to bear fruit. And you know what? Because they're dwarf trees, I'm hoping for at least one apple. And you know what? You're going to hear about it. 
You're probably going to hear about the bud. Somehow I'm going to work that in throughout my sermon series until I take that apple and give it to somebody because it's first fruit. Say, hey, enjoy it. But listen, ask yourself today, am I bearing much fruit for God? And again, the key here is this. It's abiding in the vine. Are you in Him? Are you abiding in Him? Lord, we come before You right now. And Lord, I pray this with a humble heart because God, I need to examine my own life. God, I say this right now, Lord, I need some pruning done. God, I want to have and produce much fruit for You. But I know this, that in myself I cannot do it. But God, my love for You, my obedience to You and the Holy Spirit can produce so much fruit. And God, I'm taking the step this morning saying this, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to say, God, cut away whatever is not of You in my life. Lord, prune me. Again, the idea of that potter, break me, mold me if You have to. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, God, and I just ask right now, Lord, that You cause them, Lord, to truly examine themselves and ask that question, am I bearing much fruit And God, I say that with not judging because I understand the kingdom of God is big. There's a lot of people that, man, you're using them in many ways outside these four walls. And God, they're not even, they're doing the right thing and not telling everybody. They're just giving the glory to you. But God, we want to be those that bear much fruit. Lord, you make it clear in the end times, Lord, in the days that we're living in that we're going to know if people are in you and of you because of their fruit. And God, I want people to see good fruit on the tree, Lord, that you've given me. So God, I just ask, Lord, do this work in us, Lord. Cause us, Lord, to be those that are uh, being transformed daily. And God, I even ask, Lord, that you cause us to be those that, Lord, are in your word daily to receive that renewed mind. Because God, your word will transform our thinking. And that will transform our will, our desire, our purpose. And God, I just ask, Lord, do this work, Lord, that we cannot on our own. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to do it in us. So God, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters. Keep us until we return midweek. God, I just ask, Lord, cause us all to go out of here lifting you higher, the banner of Jesus Christ, so that all men might be drawn to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.